Uh, if you're, you should all go to see those. Um, and this morning, our invited speaker is uh, Dave Walker from Princeton University. And he's the recipient of this year's ACM Robin uh, Milner Young Researcher Award, which is given by the ACM SIG plan to recognize outstanding contributions um, by young investigators in programming languages. And it's accompanied by a $2,500 prize. And I'd like to welcome Dave by reading you the citation for this award. So David Walker has made deep and varied contributions to programming language research, but always with an eye towards emerging and surprising applications of theory. He was one of the co-authors of the work on typed assembly language, TAL, which showed how conventional type systems could be brought to bear on low-level machine code, which forms the basis for today's typed virtual machines, such as Microsoft's .NET. Focusing on the need for better reasoning principles for pointers, he helped develop alias types, the calculus of capabilities, and region-based formalisms that influenced the design of type systems for modern languages like Cyclone, Vault, semantic foundations for secure program monitoring, and used his insights to develop, to develop new tools for enforcing security policies on legacy code. Long before big data was a hot topic, he and his co-authors designed languages for processing large ad hoc data collections. Recognizing trends in, in hardware, he developed new te techniques for verifying safety of program ex programs executing on faulty processors. And most recently, for seeing the rise of software-defined networking, uh, he has worked with people both within the PL community and the networking community to develop new high-level programming languages, frenetic and pyretic, for programming networks. Uh, in summary, uh, Professor Walker is a groundbreaking researcher in programming languages, connecting foundations to novel applications. And, um, that's what he's going to be telling us about this morning. And on a personal note, I wanted to say thanks to Dave because he's been a great friend and collaborator um, throughout, ever since we met in grad school. And I can think of no one uh, more deserving of this prize. So congratulations and join me in welcoming uh, Dave Walker. Thanks for that very kind uh, introduction, Steve. Um, he wished me uh, good luck um, setting me free you know, to give this talk. So if you a sitcom, uh, and I saw a very nice talk there by me to the notion of confluences uh, in research. Um, it's a metaphor for when two rivers um, come together, uh, and he explained how this applied to research and the exciting kinds of things that can happen. Uh, when I heard about this metaphor, I thought it, it suited my style of research um, very nicely, so I thought I'd tell you a little bit about that, um, how uh, some confluences um, have affected me, and a few things that we might be able to learn from that. So to be a little bit more precise, um, uh, a confluence um, involves two streams of ideas. Uh, at first, the two streams are separate. Um, but then something changes in the world. Uh, there's an inflection point. Uh, and this change uh, could be something that's external to the two uh, streams, uh, some change in technology that impacts them in some way. Uh, or it can be a change that's internal to one of the uh, two streams of, of thought, um, a breakthrough, uh, for instance, in research uh, that makes new things possible. This uh, inflection point causes the two streams to come together, uh, and if we think of one of the streams as the mainstream and the other stream as the impacting stream, then ideas in the mainstream are somehow uh, transformed by the influence of the impacting stream, uh, leading to many new uh, exciting opportunities. So as an example, we can take a look at the world of art. Uh, so in the 1800s, uh, the dominant movement was realism, and the idea there was to um, uh, for the artists to try and depict an objective reality uh, as accurately as they could. However, uh, also during the 1800s, um, photography uh, was being developed. And in 1888, uh, Kodak released their camera, uh, and their tagline was, press a button, we do the rest. So all of a sudden, uh, this group of elite artists um, were uh, no longer the only people who were able to uh, faithfully represent uh, images um, uh, on canvas. Uh, anybody could do it with a camera. 
So they had to think of something new to do to make an impact on the world. Uh, at the same time, another stream of thought um, was being developed, psychology, and one of the leading proponents was Freud. Uh, and one of his ideas was that emotion affects perception. Uh, so a group of artists took that idea uh, and um, uh, out of that grew Impressionism, where the idea was not to objectively um, try to represent some uh, reality, but uh, to filter reality through your mind um, and through your emotions uh, um, and, um, uh, and then represent uh, what comes of the combination of those two things on, uh, on canvas. So as another example, uh, we could take a look at the development of motorized cars. So uh, initially, motorized vehicles had um, a pretty simple threat model, watch out for that horse. Uh, uh, or watch out for the pedestrian, or maybe don't drive into the ditch. Um, but more recently, um, this has opened up a whole new uh, series of threats. ...able to log into a Jeep that was running on... ...caused by this change uh, in the world. Uh, Um, another long-standing thread of research, formal methods that had previously been completely separate from uh, motorized vehicles, can come into play. Um, and the Hackham's uh, project, uh, led by Kathleen Fisher, um, uh, is a new project now looking at um, how we can use formal methods uh, to help. So, as commonly happens in programming. Another stream uh, involves basic uh, programming language uh, theory. And when these two things come together, a lot of exciting things can happen. So one more uh, little example that I really like involves the confluence of model checking uh, and operating system reliability. So uh, initially, um, model checking uh, algorithms, when they were developed in the early 80s, um, were able to handle teeny tiny little systems on the order of a thousand states. be applied to real software systems or uh, being developed, uh, certain companies um, were um, dealing with a number of distress, distressed clients uh, over the blue screen of death. Uh, it turns out, though, that um, it wasn't even really necessarily usually the fault of the operating system companies uh, developing uh, their systems. The problem was with uh, device drivers developed by third parties. These device drivers could have bugs in them that would take down the entire system. Very difficult. After um, significant work in the model checking community, uh, there were a number of breakthroughs in basic research. Uh, new data structures, new algorithms, uh, new techniques and abstraction, uh, and of course there were improvements um, in, in hardware. Uh, algorithms were efficient enough to be applied uh, in practice. Uh, technology would be the verification of uh, A lot of these pictures of these confluences uh, look basically like research, and they go along separately for a while until something. The scale of the problem changes, complexity changes, um, whatever the cause, the two streams of research come together uh, and they're exciting new opportunities. Um, so a, a natural question that you might ask is, why am I telling you about these confluences? What do we have to gain? Well. Um, the main reason to, to think about them uh, is if we see the inflection points, then, then we can exploit um, exciting new opportunities. Um, in addition, if we can identify real inflection points, um, then we can potentially separate fads change. Uh, and finally, when um, we're working with people in other domains, I think it's really important to be able to see the changes as early as possible. Um, 
the earlier um, we see the change, uh, the more likely we're able to influence the thought leaders uh, in those other domains. Say the development of software uh, uh, carries on. How do we see these confluences? Is it possible to all sort of retrospective hindsight um, analysis? So, I mean, my answer here is it's not always possible for us to see uh, these confluences as, we, as they happen, um, but we can improve our chances uh, if we um, basically make friends with people uh, in other domains. Um, by having connections with our colleagues, um, uh, we improve the chances that we're going to be aware of some of the big changes. Once we are aware, um, we can bring our deep, reusable, hard-to-learn, powerful skills and tools uh, to bear uh, on the problems at hand, um, and uh, together we can uh, change the world. So this is a very Sesame Street slide, but because I'm a, uh, giving an invited talk, I'm allowed to say it anyway. Uh, this is what I believe, and if there's a message uh, from the talk, this is it. Make friends, learn skills, change the world. Okay, so I wanted to talk about two confluences in my career. Um, one at the beginning when I was in grad school, um, and the focus here is on learning skills. I'm gonna talk about confluences in type systems and reliable systems implementation. Uh, and then the second um, is um, later uh, in my career, more recently, um, uh, and the emphasis here is going to be on making friends and talking about confluences and network configuration. Okay, so grad school. So uh, the first uh, stream of thought uh, involves type safety. Um, and uh, it wouldn't be a Milner Award lecture without a little bit of Milner. So um, if one wants an entry point uh, into the history of uh, type safety proofs, one uh, place one can start is with uh, this classic paper on uh, theory of type polymorphism in programming. Uh, this is where Milner introduced um, the type assignment uh, algorithm that grew into um, what we think of as uh, ML style polymorphism. So in order to prove his um, type system sound, Milner uh, took a denotational approach to the safety proof where he mapped the syntax of programs into a collection of um, domains. Um, and one of the key elements of the proof was defining a semantic relation um, by induction on the structure of types. A few years later, his student, uh, Louis Damas, um, thought about adding references to ML. Uh, and he also wanted the safety proof. Um, in order to do that, though, he had to construct a whole different uh, semantic theory. Uh, and uh, he tried induction on typing, but that fails. And he needed a, a much more complicated categorical argument um, to prove the existence of the key semantic relation. And it turns out it was complicated enough uh, that a number of years later, a hole was found uh, in the proof by, by Mads Tofta. And there were many more papers in this vein. Here's another one by Abadi, Cardelli, Pierce, uh, and Plotkin, um, where they talked about uh, dynamic typing, and they had another proof technique um, based on metric space uh, arguments. So uh, where we were at is there were many people that were working on uh, tiny little elegant languages. Uh, each time we'd consider a new feature, um, and we had to come up with a completely new proof technique. Uh, so the gap between uh, these little lambda calculi people were studying and real systems and languages uh, was enormous, and it looked like it was getting bigger because these proofs get, kept getting harder. Uh, but then came uh, the really key inflection point, I think, uh, which was um, Fleissen's paper on a syntactic approach uh, to type soundness. So here, uh, some of the key contributions were uh, that the semantics was given by program rewriting, uh, and there was the idea that you would check the program at every step, reusing the type system. Uh, and this uh, gave us uh, our modern notion of type preservation, and a modern type preservation lemma. Uh, and the real key to this paper was uh, they demonstrated that the same design pattern, the same proof technique, could be used over and over again for several different languages and many different features. So it seemed like um, if we learned this, this was a key reusable skill that we'd be able to use over and over and over again. Um, 
closely thereafter, Bob Harper uh, published his simplified account of polymorphic uh, references, uh, and a number of the same uh, themes came, um, were presented there, although the, the formation of the operational semantics was a little different. Uh, there was still a little bit more polishing of the proof uh, that needed to happen, um, and um, over time, Bob Harper developed the modern notion of canonical forms and the modern notion of progress lemma. He taught his students those key techniques, and one of his students, Greg Morissette, uh, ran from CMU to Cornell, where um, I became his graduate student. So there was a lot of things that one could do with this new technology, and lots of people in the community uh, did um, some really exciting things, um, including scaling up um, our type safety proofs to real languages like standard ML. What we did was we looked at how type safety was being used in practice, uh, and we saw um, that it was being used as the foundation for mobile code systems um, and for systems um, differing uh, degrees of trust. Um, in components. Uh, so in particular, the JVM was new, um, and we were also inspired by uh, the SPIN operating system that was coming out of University of Washington, where the idea was one could write type-safe kernel extensions, download those extensions uh, into the kernel, and rely on type safety uh, to ensure that uh, they would execute properly. So the basic theme that was going on uh, in these application areas was typed interfaces plus type safety give you uh, secure, efficient sandboxes. Um, but type checking happened um, at the source. Uh, and of course, um, computer, uh, consumers had to trust a compiler uh, to preserve those safety invariants. Uh, and compilers, even for the JVM, uh, were 100,000 um, or more lines of code. Uh, and errors in these systems are inevitable. So uh, our idea was, can we pull the compiler out of the trusted computing base? Um, instead of type checking the source language programs, uh, can we type check uh, the target language programs? So uh, the system uh, that we designed um, uh, showed you how to take high level them all the way down to assembly language um, at each properties that we're interested in. So we would take uh, source level terms and source level typing annotations, type check the source uh, language programs, compile them into an intermediate language, both the terms and the typing annotations, optimize those, retype check, find any bugs in the compiler that were introduced, compile them into target language uh, terms and target language types, uh, and re-optimize again. Um, so uh, our work was uh, directly inspired by the TIL type-directed uh, optimizing uh, compiler that was developed at CMU. TIL started this process by taking source-level languages and compiling them into typed intermediate languages, but then they did the work on, on proof-carrying code by uh, George Nekula uh, and Peter Lee. Uh, what they did was they suggested that people might write assembly language programs by hand uh, and annotate them. Um, and then pass around the proofs to demonstrate safety. Uh, and so what we did in our paper from system F to type to semi language is we connected these two ideas, uh, basically showing that you could take source level programs, generate type target level programs, um, and their proofs of safety fully automatically. So to give you a little taste of that, I could uh, talk about a teeny little example involving a little bit of code uh, that implements uh, some function. So this function is going to be an assembly language function. Um, uh, it is, its goal is to add the value in EAX to the sum from 1 to the value in EBX. It's going to use EAX as an accumulator, EBX as a counter. Um, and it's also going to assume that a return address um, is passed to the function in the register ECX. And that return address is going to expect a result in the register EAX. So here's the code for that function uh, and the details. Um, uh, instructions. Uh, so in order to type check this, we had to model some of the structures that you find uh, in assembly language. Uh, and so one of the key structures is the register file, and we modeled that. We gave those register files types, uh, and the type 
the type of each value uh, in each register. Uh, in addition, um, we uh, gave types to all the values in the machine. Uh, and so there were some simple t base types, like in 32s, in 64s. Um, there was type for code that told you what sort. Uh, and then there were some standard um, abstract, uh, abstract types and, and polymorphic types. Is that um, most of what we did involved taking known ideas uh, and just piecing them together uh, in new ways. The, the main uh, wrinkle here was in these register file types uh, and the fact that doing type checking involved changing the register file type uh, at each step. So if we were to type check some, we would, oh, forgot about that. So, um, if we wanted to give a type to sum, uh, what we would do is give it this type on the right, uh, and that says that it expects in EAX and in 32, in EBX and in 32, and in ECX it expects some code that in turn respects EAX to have an in 32. Uh, and then to type check the body of sum, uh, we basically do a sort of forward symbolic using the register file types to check all our constraints. Okay. <clears throat> Um, so, one of the things that uh, I really liked about typed assembly language, one of my favorite parts, was uh, the fact that because we had developed the language from all these um, standard orthogonal type constructors, we could mix and match them and play games uh, to um, specify various interesting in invariants that show up in compilers. And in particular, we looked at specifying um, different kinds of calling conventions. So I showed you one calling convention where the sum, expect, the sum procedure expects its arguments in EAX and EBX, and it expects its return address in ECX, um, but there are other con calling conventions one could consider. For example, one um, might consider a calling convention using callee save registers. Uh, so the idea here is that EDX would expect a value with type alpha, and then the return address expects uh, that when you return, EDX will contain a value of type alpha. Uh, so we use standard ideas um, from um, a parametricity uh, to argue that because the only alpha that this uh, code has access to is the one that we originally passed to EDX, uh, then that is the value that's going to get um, returned in EDX when we jump to our a return address in ECX. Um, and so Carl Crary actually invented a, a nice um, uh, refined proof technique for proving that kind of uh, result for us. Uh, another um, calling convention, another discipline uh, that we studied um, was a stack typing discipline. So instead of passing values in registers, one could pass values uh, on the stack. Uh, so here we're going to sum the values from um, the top of the stack, ESP0, um, uh, and sum that with 1 through uh, ESP4. So the code is going to look pretty similar, um, but we're going to assume that ESP0 can contains the accumulator, ESP4 contains the counter, and ESP8 uh, uh, contains the return address. So we've created an activation record on the top of the stack. Um, so once again, in order to develop this typing discipline, we had to do a little bit of modeling. Uh, and we modeled the stack very simply as lists of values. So a stack could be nil or it could be value followed by some uh, stack. Uh, and then we developed a little language of stack types. Uh, and those stack types um, involved an algebra of lists. So we had nil for the empty stack. Uh, some type tau const on to the top of a, a, a stack. We had abstract stacks row or polymorphic stacks row, uh, and then we could also um, uh, describe a stack as the concatenation of two stack segments. Okay, so with this machinery, we could um, give a type to the sum procedure that now used the stack, uh, and the key idea there was again using. Um, something standard that we borrow from any conventional uh, type system, which is polymorphism. So the idea was we wanted our sum procedure to be run 
no matter what the calling context was. So no matter what stack um, <clears throat> had already been allocated by other uh, procedures. Uh, and so uh, the way we did that um, is we quantified over the tail of the stack row. Uh, so this um, code type here says for all stacks row, uh, what I expect is I expect my stack pointer register ESP to contain a stack that contains an integer on top, an integer next, a return address uh, that expects the register EAX to contain an integer and expects the stack pointer to contain the stack row. And finally, row is the tail of the stack. So once again, we use this idea of um, parametricity to give us a few more invariants um, about our code as well. Um, so because the stack is abstract, we could actually prove that, um, uh, that the callee can't mess with the caller stack, um, much the same way as the callee save registers worked out. Okay, so Tal x86 um, um, gave us a, a wonderful playground uh, to investigate um, many of the constructs uh, that appear in high-level languages but map down into lower-level rep representations. Uh, and so we looked at representations of closures and data types and arrays and mechanisms for exceptions. Uh, we looked at types and kinds for describing the sizes of objects in memory, for um, tracking allocation and initialization of objects. Um, Neil Glue looked at linking, so how to take two components uh, and put them together uh, safely. Uh, and so the moral of the story here is that um, we reused a lot of basic research uh, in type theory, um, but um, because of the uh, advent of syntactic methods, we were able to explore a new domain. This is a new domain that, uh, in which all of the things that had previously been difficult to put together, polymorphism, higher order functions, imperative state, continuations, all of those things had to be mixed together uh, in order to be able to explore this uh, rich new area of problems. Um, and we were able to do that because of the breakthroughs uh, in basic research. Um, in terms of biggest contribution, I, I think perhaps uh, the biggest contribution um, is maybe not necessarily any of the details, but um, just um, showing that it was actually possible um, to prove strong safety properties uh, in general purpose uh, assembly language programs. Uh, I remember um, that actually, I think that um, the Tau paper might have gotten some of the worst reviews I have ever gotten at Popple and yet still gotten into the conference. And I remember when we gave the talk, Carl actually gave the talk, there was a great deal of resistance and most people, many people, not most people, many people uh, still said they thought it was impossible uh, and tried to poke holes uh, in our type system thinking it, it must be wrong um, despite our, our, our proofs to the contrary. Um, and perhaps um, um, that suggests that in any event, doing research in an extreme setting uh, is a lot of fun. Um, and uh, doing things that people say are impossible is even more fun. Okay, so some, some non-technical takeaways. Um, this project served me incredibly well uh, in grad school. I used to joke with my friends that I only knew one non-trivial proof technique, uh, and that was progress and preservation. And I practiced it over and over again um, so that you know, I could glance at a set of typing rules uh, on sheets of paper and you know, quickly point, point out things that were likely to be fundamental flaws if they weren't following the inv invariants that, uh, that I had learned. Um, a second thing I learned was how to develop small models. This is something that our programming languages community does incredibly well. We take objects in reality and um, we try to provide uh, semantics in an idealized setting to try and get at the essence of what makes the problem really hard. Uh, so I designed lots of tiny type systems and simple algebras. Uh, and both of these two skills are basically uh, the two skills that I've used over and over and over and over again for the rest of my career, and I've barely used uh, anything else. Uh, and one other thing that I wanted to say about learning was that I not only learned to my, with, from my advisor, which is great, but I learned from all the students uh, who were around me. 
Uh, every morning, I would go and walk down to Neil Glue's office, and I would ask him some dumb question about how do existential types work, or how does subtyping recursive type works. Uh, and by that process, I slowly learned uh, a great deal uh, about uh, these basic concepts uh, that would you know, serve me for the rest of my career. So the um, uh, so the, this research, you know, was done about 15 years ago, uh, and um, since that time, uh, the state of the art has evolved in really exciting ways. Uh, there's another confluence uh, that's that's going on that is um, really exciting, uh, and in order to make to go from safe systems where we use type checking to unbreakable systems, um, we have brought. Um, streams of thought on logical frameworks uh, into the picture. Uh, and I think uh, this might be possible because of improved tools, such as improvements in Cox type checking uh, ability, uh, and um, also uh, potentially because of collaborative resources on the web. So we have lots of open source theorems and libraries that people can develop, share, uh, and build upon. Uh, and this has led to uh, really exciting achievements like Comcert, SEL4, Certicoche, RockSalt, uh, and the new uh, DeepSpec project. Okay, so if the first uh, section of the talk was about professor life and making friends, uh, the second uh, component of the talk, oops, the first thought, the first was about skills. The second component uh, is about um, making friends. Um, so, um, this was my experiences with confluences in network configuration. Uh, and this project um, has had contributions from a very large number of people, many of those people in the networking community as well as in uh, the programming languages uh, community. Um, two people especially I wanted to, to mention are Jennifer Re Rexford, my colleague at Princeton, uh, who's a networking researcher, uh, and uh, Nate Foster, who's a professor uh, at Cornell. Um, so the first stream of thought uh, we'll start out with uh, is uh, on network configuration. So uh, in a traditional network, uh, we have collections of routers, uh, and each router maintains its own view of the world, uh, and it uses some standard protocol uh, to communicate information about available routes to its neighbors, uh, and then it will compute um, uh, the routes that it wants to use locally based on that information. Uh, and so the way network operators will um, configure uh, these routers uh, is they'll basically select from predefined protocols. So in the picture above, uh, OSPF is a protocol that computes uh, shortest paths, and BGP is another protocol that communicates information with uh, neighboring networks. Uh, and in this endeavor, um, the hardware vendors who uh, manufacture the routers, um, they control all the software. Um, uh, in addition, because uh, these uh, devices are designed to be fully distributed and plug and play, the protocols um, um, evolve very slowly because they have, there has to be agreement um, between the various vendors whenever there's a change that's made. So. Um, over the last 10 years, um, something's happened in networking. Um, basically, um, in a nutshell, data center infrastructure um, has scaled way up. And this has put a lot of financial pressure on the owners of these big networks, and in turn, uh, put pressure on the people um, that make switches. And um, in a nutshell, the owners of these infrastructures now basically stand to gain a lot from having customized and centralized network control algorithms, as opposed to having completely distributed um, algorithms with protocols that evolve slowly um, according to um, standards. A really uh, nice example of this uh, is in Google's backbone network. So on the slide, you can see a picture of Google's uh, B4 backbone network. Uh, it connects all of the data centers uh, uh, around the world. And um, traditional networks, um, traditional wide area networks, like the networks uh, maybe owned by AT&T, don't have control over N any of the end hosts. All the bits in those networks are treated the same. Um, and uh, in order to ensure uh, good latency uh, and 
um, fault tolerance, the networks are very over-provisioned, um, giving um, just 30 to 40 percent utilization. Um, but before, uh, Google's network has a lot of quite different properties. Um, in particular, Google owns all the infrastructure. They own the, uh, the end hosts. They own the applications that are running on those end hosts. And because they have control over those applications, uh, they can limit their sending rates when appropriate. Uh, they've also been able to identify multiple different classes of traffic in their uh, data center. So there's user traffic, for instance, which is actually quite low volume. Not very much of the traffic is user traffic, um, but it's pretty latency sens sensitive. Uh, on the other hand, most of the data that travels over their network uh, is a data that comes from doing very large data copies. So one data center might compute a new index for the web, and then all that data has to be copied to all the rest of the data centers. Uh, so the thing about that data, it's very high volume, petabytes of data, uh, but it's relatively latency insensitive, uh, and it's even somewhat fault tolerant. So if there's some delay pushing out the next version of the web index, it's not a big deal. Um, and so because of that elasticity, uh, Google is able to, um, through centralized control of their network and centralized control of um, uh, the routing that these various paths and, and the rate limiting, uh, they're able to achieve nearly 100% utilization on some links. Uh, and they get averages of 70% of or more throughout, giving them two to three times um, cost savings, which is a big deal when you're running an intercontinental network, apparently. Um, so the technology that's behind, um, uh, that allows, uh, or at least part of the technology that allows Google to do what it's doing um, uh, is called software-defined networking. Uh, and in this technology, instead of having each router have its own copy of a distributed uh, algorithm and run in a completely uh, decentralized way, uh, the brains of the operation are removed uh, and implemented on a centralized general purpose controller machine. So that centralized general purpose controller machine um, uh, takes information about traffic patterns and such, makes some decision about what routes it wants to install, uh, and then it sends um, instructions to each of the switches. Uh, and those uh, little instructions uh, imp are then implemented by uh, the switches themselves, and they then uh, use those instructions to forward um, packets through the network. So OpenFlow is the name of the protocol that allows the controller machine to communicate with uh, this network of switches. Uh, you can think of it as a new network assembly language. Um, it's very simple, it's very flexible um, as well, and it's capable of allowing you to assemble instructions to uh, piece together any forwarding path for packets that you want. Okay, so our, our picture now looks like this. Um, we started with a network configuration using distributed protocols. Um, there were some significant uh, uh, economic changes uh, and infrastructure changes in the networking infrastructure, and there was a, a new technology uh, that was developed there. Um, what can we uh, contribute to this? Well, uh, what we uh, were able to contribute was a lot of ideas from this community on um, how to design structured programming languages uh, that allow you to take, um, uh, to create programs by writing small little programs and sticking them together uh, to create more complex artifacts from, from little pieces. So we, we talk, took our sensitivities in terms of modularity uh, and reasoning principles uh, and applied them to this uh, new domain. So uh, in more detail, um, the way early SDN systems work is an event would come in and then some computation would run, uh, and the effect of that would be that the machine would run a series of imperative commands. And these imperative commands would, uh, for instance, install a rule uh, R1 on um, switch A, where these rules are match action rules that match on some bits in a packet and execute some actions, such as dropping the packet, forwarding the packet in a particular direction, um, or modifying the packet in some way. So uh, these uh, computers would issue a stream of instructions, install this rule, install this rule, install this rule, remove this rule, um, etc. Uh, so it's an imperative stream of instructions. Um, of course, this is a distributed system, so it would send 
these modifications to the, uh, the switches as a series of messages. Uh, and it turns out that uh, the variability um, in uh, time to install these messages is actually very high. It can even be seconds, or in extreme cases, even minutes. Um, <coughs> and at the same time, as these modifications to these switches are happening, um, the switches are also processing packets uh, at very high rates. So basically what you have in these early SDN systems is an event-driven, iterative, concurrent programming language where the switches are tables of rules that are being modified, and then asynchronously these other things are going by at the same time. So you really have this who's who of what's the hardest programming tasks in the world. So um, in order to um, put a little bit more discipline on this uh, situation, um, uh, we started the, uh, the Frenetic project. Uh, and the basic idea there was to uh, implement a layer on top of this assembly language. Uh, and in this layer, an event would come in, and instead of issuing a series of imperative instructions, we would generate a high level a declarative policy that said what to do about the whole network uh, all at once. So for instance, a high-level policy might specify a particular path uh, the package should take from uh, switch B to C to A. Uh, then um, we would implement a compiler, uh, and that compiler would translate these high-level declarative policies uh, into the low-level assembly uh, programs, and the runtime schedule system would schedule uh, the uh, installation of uh, rules on the switches. And so the idea was that uh, uh, experts um, once uh, could implement a compiler that would take care of many of these concurrency issues. Uh, and uh, many network operators uh, could use this uh, language uh, and avoid having to worry about uh, these details. It's the same story uh, as um, people working on garbage collection um, back in the 60s. Um, there's something really hard to do. Let's get an expert to do it once. Uh, and relieve uh, the, many of the problems um, for most programmers. Okay, so uh, from the programmer's view, what we wanted to supply then was a situation where an event comes in, they generate uh, a policy, uh, then another event comes in, they generate a policy, uh, but um, the, uh, of course, we needed some mechanism to go from one policy to the next. Um, and in the underlying network, uh, while this transition is happening, there are many packets in flight. If we simply were to try and do the transition by, for instance, immediately uh, removing some rules from switch C, then this green packet in the picture would get dropped, for instance. Um, and um, in other circumstances, lots of other bad things can happen. Uh, loops can be created, which increases the traffic and congestion. Um, packets can be misdirected. Access control policies can be um, um, broken, uh, etc. So clearly what we needed was some mechanism that could preserve uh, some of these good properties that the user defined policies had um, across updates. Um, so what kinds of properties did we want to preserve? Well, um, we started out by trying to preserve what we call per, per packet um, path properties. Uh, and these properties are properties of a single packet um, it's path through the network and any modifications to the packet along the way. Uh, so these are things like access control, reachability, waypointing, but not properties like congestion, because congestion is a property of many packets at the same time. Okay. Um, so which of these properties uh, do we want to preserve? Well, we started out by trying to preserve all properties of this form uh, that were preserved across two consecutive policies. So the advantage here is that the programmers didn't need to tell us which invariants of the policies that they really cared about because we'd preserve all invariants that are shared between two consecutive policies. Um, in addition, um, we showed that if there's some invariant that you really care about, such as your, um, um, none of your policies at any point in time have a loop in them, uh, then you can actually um, check that property by checking each policy individually. And if you check each policy individually, we'll take care of um, all of the transitions as well. Okay, so uh, the basic way that we achieved these goals uh, was we uh, defined uh, what we called a, a per packet consistent update. 
Uh, and the idea here was that every packet uh, either traverses uh, the old policy or the new policy, uh, but not some mixture of both. Initially, the mechanism that we used to implement that um, is something we call the two-phase uh, commit. Uh, and before we got started, what we did was we pre-processed all the policies, such that um, every policy had a version number. So in this case, you could think of the version numbers as the green color and the blue color. Um, and at entry locations, a green policy would stamp an incoming packet with the green version number. And at internal locations, the policy would look to see, do you have my version number? If so, I will apply my rules. If not, I will do nothing. Okay. And so to update from green to blue, uh, in the first phase, what we did was we added new blue rules to the internal switches. Um, so while packets um, came in, uh, they continued to be stamped green um, and processed by green rules. In phase two, we overwrote the entry locations um, with green stamping rules, and that began the transition, and we knew the, the green rules were in place. Uh, so that was, um, um, so that was initial um, uh, implementation of consistent updates. Um, the thing I like about it, uh, one of the things that, that was very gratifying is we, we, we published this work in a, a networking conference, um, but we got to throw a little bit of operational semantics at them uh, and show them how to do a proof of a strong um, uh, property uh, like this. Um, so that was always fun. Um, since we have, um, since we've done this work, um, a number of people um, in the programming languages community and in the networking community um, have thought that the basic idea of preserving these kinds of invariants is pretty important, um, but they've um, improved uh, and refined the work in quite a number of, of ways, which is really nice. Okay, so um, if consistent updates uh, is about modular reasoning uh, in time, then um, our various policy languages might be uh, considered a form of modular reasoning in space. Um, so the languages that we defined are all languages that have collections of combinators that allow you to glue together small policies to make more complicated ones. So for instance, um, if one policy um, implements a path um, through the blue path through the network and another policy implements the green path through the network, then you can um, take the union of those two policies. Uh, and now this seems incredibly natural uh, and straightforward, but in the early versions of these programming languages, um, it wasn't possible to take the union of policies uh, in any easy way. Um, of course, once you lift up the level of abstraction, um, it's not so hard to define. So we've uh, developed a, a whole series of uh, network programming languages um, that have various different features. Um, and um, some of this work uh, I've done, some of the work um, my colleagues has done and I haven't done, uh, some of the work has been done by networking researchers who have built on top of our systems and uh, developed new abstractions, which is really great. Uh, so the main takeaway here is uh, the networking research uh, community has um, really embraced openly um, language-based approaches to network configuration, and that's really exciting. Um, so for instance, uh, the so SIGCOM is the SIG for networking, uh, and they sponsor uh, the ACM um, Symposium on Software-Defined Networking Research. Uh, and one of the key topics that they're encouraging people to submit on is programming languages, verification, and testing techniques for software-defined networks, things that everyone in the audience does uh, incredibly well. Um, it's also the case that there's a new language that's uh, being developed. And instead of being oriented around protocols, it's really uh, being oriented around uh, linguistic framework. So we've, we've shifted the mindset of a lot of people in the networking community. So this started uh, as a little um, programming languages networking working group that um, I was a part of. Um, but now it's a much bigger thing uh, and it's got 33 member organizations um, and a lot of energy uh, and steam behind it, um, including um, a lot of energy from uh, industry. And several networking, or several PL folks are providing um, uh, intermittent feedback now on the design of the language. Last, um, and, or at least one more um, example of some impact that we're making uh, is Nick Feemster was a professor at Georgia Tech and he started a MOOC when he was there. He's since moved to Princeton 
um, but he started it at, at, at Georgia Tech. Um, and he has thousands and thousands of students that take his class on software-defined networking uh, each year. Um, and you know, he has roughly 1,000 that do all, this, all the assignments. So uh, one year, he did a survey of 870 students. And this included 217 full-time network operators, which is pretty great that they're taking this class. Uh, and one of the languages that he built on top of the Pyretic language that we built um, was used in the course, and he also taught about um, pyretic as variant of frenetic in the course. Uh, and 79% of the people who took the survey, at least, uh, said that they preferred uh, kinetic to the way current things were being done. Um, and 84% um, agreed that it helped make it easier to, to figure out that your policies were actually doing the right thing. Okay. So some non-technical takeaways. Uh, sometimes the research uh, is all about the detailed result you know, progress and preservation and the fine details of how this proof works. Uh, but sometimes uh, it's communication uh, and people that matter most. Uh, so in this case, um, we got into SDN right at the very beginning. Um, and um, the reason for that um, is our colleague Jen Rexford in, in networking. Um, she developed intellectual precursors uh, to software-defined networking at AT&T. Um, she spotted the uh, SDN inflection point. She knew it was um, interesting. Um, and she and, and Jonathan Smith, also at um, UPenn, uh, roped me into um, writing a grant with them. Uh, and we just started working on this stuff. Um, and um, the rest is history, so they say. Um, but not quite, of course. We had incredible support from many brilliant people, including uh, Nate Foster and many others. Because we got in so early, uh, and because Jen knew all of the people that were at the uh, forefront starting this enterprise, uh, we got Mindshare. Uh, we, uh, Jen gave an early keynote talk at an industrial forum, uh, the Open Networking Summit. It was followed up the next year by a keynote talk uh, by Nate Foster. And Jen has given many, many more talks uh, in industry. Uh, and, and now I think it, it's reasonable to say that words like composition and modularity are on the tongues of all Uh, into their heads that it's really important to think about uh, those properties when uh, designing your systems. So the moral of the story is make friends. Um, it doesn't matter how much technical know-how we have. We could never have done any of this research without the programming language, or without the networking community. Okay, so uh, the summary then um, is um, this simple picture. Um, Confluences between application domains and basic research are really exciting. Make friends um, in uh, the application domain of your choice. Pick the colleague who you think is doing the absolute coolest work, uh, who communicates well, and you get along with. Learn something about what they're doing. Um, we can use our incredibly powerful programming languages skills to tackle problems uh, in so many different domains. It's a really exciting time for programming languages right now, I think. Um, from the world, thank you. I want to thank um, all my many uh, collaborators uh, and mentors. Um, um, I've learned so much from them, and um, yeah, definitely wouldn't be where uh, I am without uh, all their help. So thank you. Yeah, so what, what new inflection points do you see? Oh, great question. Um, well, uh, it's clear that um, something really exciting uh, is happening, um, I think, with uh, machine learning uh, and programming languages. Um, um, there are so many more people that are wanting to do machine learning. What's happening is you're creating a community that's big enough, I think, uh, to support the development of 
programming languages in that domain, right? In order to have a programming language, you have to have lots and lots of users of that programming language. So I think uh, certainly something that's, that's happening uh, is we've got enough people that want to do machine learning that they need specialized programming languages. Um, and we should uh, get in on that. So if there's one, uh, if there's one place that actually the, the programming languages community hasn't contributed quite as much as maybe I would have hoped, um, it would be um, in big data programming. We had, you know, all the ideas in functional programming that um, are now being used um, in, uh, to do data center programming, um, but I see very few papers on big data programming at um, them uh, at OSDI. Um, um, we don't want to miss the um, here at Popple, which is really fantastic, um, and I hope to see hope to see more of that. Um, so, the question was, are there other kinds of in inflection points where the application domain um, influences uh, the programming languages? I definitely think yes. So, um, for example, in, um, um, like when Tom Ball and uh, Sri Ram um, noticed that, hey, we can use model checking to verify um, device drivers. The domain of device drivers was such a perfect fit that I think it helped push forward uh, the technology uh, for doing uh, verification of that kind. So um, a good domain uh, provides really compelling motivation for us to hone our skills uh, and develop better and better techniques for that domain, which then principles and such. And I think that happened there. I want to say our research in programming languages for networks was possible only because systems people, in particular Nick McEwen, um, came up with a much, much better um, assembly language for programming the network. So before you had these, you were configuring these big uh, distributed protocols. Those big distributed protocols don't compose with each other at all. It's like either you run OSPF or you run BGP. You can't run the union of OSPF and BGP. It just doesn't make any sense. But OpenFlow gives you these little rules, and you can stick together those little rules in lots of creative ways. Uh, and that gave us a platform on which to build um, our programming languages. So that's not quite an answer to your The networking community did business, gave us an opening where we so I think that changes in all places are really uh, important. Programming languages can help other people solve their problems. Who can help us solve our problems? Are there competences in the other direction? Nobody. <laughs> no, I, I, I think uh, I think that our um, so, uh, our area, I, I don't want to sound like elitist jerk, but um, our area is pretty hard. <laughs> and it takes a long time, and, a, and this is serious, it takes a long time and a lot of deep learning to understand how to put together a sensible programming language. On the other hand, you know, it's not that hard to learn OpenFlow. That is pretty easy. So if I'm a student, what I want, what you should be doing in grad school is learning the deep, hard programming languages skills first, I think. Focusing on honing those skills, uh, and then once you've got some really hardcore repeatable skills, then go out and look for the applications. I would have one more little ad lib. One thing that I sometimes worry about 
is that there's publication pressure for students who like right from the beginning because now to get a job you have to have like 25 PLDI papers um, and I fear that this um, publication pressure will pressure some students to get quick hit publications in which is deeply studying fundamental Uh, that will allow you later to make um, more influential contributions. Hi, I'm Thorsten Altenkrieg. Uh, I like to uh, consider maybe a slightly different answer than you have just given. <laughs> Some people can read my um, I mean, I'm here, this is a bit out of my main domain. Yeah? I find it quite a bit applied, a bit hacky, yeah, to be honest. And I think there's some help, I hope, to come from logic and stuff like category theory and maybe even some mathematics and so on. So I don't think you're I count, I count that as us. But yeah, no, no fair, fair point. Uh, fair, fair point. Yeah, absolutely. From, yeah, so part of learning skills is learning deep math. Um, yeah, that's a completely reasonable point. Since you're in Princeton, you're not far away from some yeah. very deep math, for example. Thank you. So thank you for an amazing talk. One of the great things you said was the importance of simplicity. I want to ask you to go back to that. Where did you succeed because you were simple? Where did you succeed in spite of not being able to make it simple again? So I, I think that um, um, we defined this very, very, very simple um, criteria for consistent update of the network. Packet should follow the old policy or the new. Everyone in the networking community instantly realized this was the right idea, I think. Well, I'm exaggerating maybe a bit, but um, many people thought that this was a, a great idea, and the simplicity of the idea um, meant that many other networking people could build upon it very easily. Um, and When you, do a, when you do a simple thing, people can build on it. When you do a complicated thing, people ignore it. Uh, like in type assembly language, you know, we um, built these really, really, we started with these really, really simple models of assembly language. Register, file, stack, these are really simple objects. Um, and, but I think that they were easy to, for people to understand, and lots of people followed on and did. And we're able to do much more complicated I mean, I guess if I could say a, a place I failed would be some of the papers in networking that we've published in Popple. Um, we do the whole, let's throw lots of math because it's Popple. And uh, to be honest, we don't get much out of the papers that we publish in Popple because they've got too much, too much math in them. So is that a mistake? I don't know. We switch back and forth between programming languages, conferences, and networking conferences. We give you guys the math. We give them the